It has come to this, Europe versus Asia. I've been telling people it was bound to happen, but it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing because you are a consumer and you get to choose between two of these compact SUVs in the luxury class. So which one will you favor? Well, let's have a look at both of them and I'll let you choose. There's something about the luxury class that they don't particularly like putting names on cars. They like to do an alpha uh, numerical thing. And guess what? In this particular luxury car shootout, God, I hate that term. Um, we have on the left, the BMW X1. And on the right, we have the Lexus NX 350H. And the H stands for hybrid. So this is going to be an interesting comparison. Now, why these two vehicles? And naturally it has nothing to do that I just happened to get them both at the same time out of pure luck. No, it has nothing to do with that. No, no, no. Stop it. The fact is, these are very, very similar vehicles in that the BMW has a wheelbase of 106 inches. Well, first of all, I should start at the beginning and just say, yes, they're both compact sport utilities. And yes, they both have all-wheel drive. Okay. But they also have the same wheelbase. Almost identical. The BMW is 106 inches and uh, has this, note the profile, kind of an upright, scoot-about, yet SUV-ish aspect. <laughs> and uh, it, it's a very good size, but not what I would call a true... It's almost to the... Uh, subcompact but not really it's it's and as you'll see from the room as we go it's surprisingly roomy uh the the lexus has a 105.9 inch wheelbase but look it looks a little bit swoopier in my opinion but then again they're both very very similar i think they're absolutely competing for your dollar um uh there is one big difference of course in the drivetrain which is the fact that the uh Lexus right here is a hybrid, and it doesn't even say hybrid on it. Look at that. It just says all-wheel drive, NX350H, but the H stands for hybrid, really. And it also has kind of a, a sporting yet fat aspect. You know, there's a time where companies like Lexus and BMW wouldn't be caught dead with such a lumpy-looking vehicle. But then the SUV craze arrived, and look what we got now. But they both have, uh, as you'll see, very, very similar uh, spec sheets. For example, uh, even though one, they're both four-cylinder engines, one of them's turbocharged, the other is not. One of them's a hybrid, the other is not. And yet they're within two horsepower of each other in terms of overall output of the engines. It's kind of interesting, kind of surprising in a way. Uh, what about price? Well, the Lexus is a lot more expensive, but as you'll see, the Lexus has got a lot more stuff on it. And which one is more fuel efficient? Again, the Lexus is a lot more fuel efficient than the BMW because it's a hybrid. But otherwise, they, they go about the same way in terms of what they're designed to do. They're designed to take uh, four people comfortably in any weather situation around town, Light trail work, possibly. Snow, absolutely. So they're very good all-weather vehicles, and they are designed to pamper and comfort you and deliver a lot of the latest technology, all in a compact package that's easy to park and actually fairly easy to just deal with in general. It's much nicer than a big hulking SUV. 
if you don't have the requirement for a whole lot of towing. And how much can they tow? Well, the BMW can tow more. It's, uh, I think, 3,700 pounds, and the Lexus can tow 2,000 pounds. But are you gonna really do a lot of towing with these things? I mean, come on, come on. So before we, uh, without any more ado, because we've had so much ado already, let's have a look at these engines and compare the two of them. Because once again, a very different approach, but the overall outcome in terms of power is very, very similar. Oh, how's your bimmer? Here we have our X1 power plant. And uh, interesting thing, if you've heard me gaggle on about uh, German cars, you may have noticed that I have said, waha, there we go, that they're very fond of running their, in, their inline engines uh, longitudinally, i.e. forward to back, like that way. But on this particular vehicle, and on some others, but on this one in particular, they run it like everybody else does. They run it transversely. So one, two, three, four. That's where your cylinders are. And naturally, we're turbocharged. So do they do the front or the back turbocharge installation? Well, here's our air filter. Here's our air going around back. And somewhere below this, and here's a little stiffener, by the way, to ensure... Uh, that your chassis is under control when you're getting all loose on your curved uh, back blacktop there. Uh, the turbocharger's down there deep within somewhere in between the uh, firewall and the engine. You come around the front and somehow the, it, it, it spins, it's called a twin power turbo and that would imply that there's more than one turbocharger but there isn't, it's just a Go to another YouTube channel and read up on it if you're interested because it's kind of interesting. The point of it all is to try to give you, get the turbocharger spinning up as low an RPM as possible so that it'll fill in the lower gaps in the inline four engine at the very basement where it really needs more torque. So that takes care of that. But at the same time, it's also capable of boosting power at higher RPMs. So hence the term twin is it kind of has a dual function. Now exactly how it does this, there's a couple of different uh, scenarios about how turbochargers in general, not just BMW, but how they uh, use turbocharging in different ways to do that. That's the ultimate goal is to be able to spin up at a low RPM but not run out of breath at higher RPMs. And BMW does this very well. They've been doing this for years, and they, so they make a very, very good turbocharging system. Uh, anyway, it goes uh, through the exhaust system, spins the impeller, compresses the air, goes through an intercooler somewhere. Boy, it's packed in here. I'm telling you right now, this engine is just stuffed in here. But we ultimately come around front to our plastic. It's always plastic these days. Runners that go into our intake system and our direct fuel injection. So there we go, and so what are the numbers? Well, well, let's have a look here. Uh, the twin power turbo puts out 241 horsepower, and that's between 4,500 RPM and 6,500 RPM. Torque, a very generous 295 pounds of feet at anywhere from 1,500 up to 4,000 RPM. Nice, flat, long, low torque peak. So they have taken this little four-cylinder engine, all two liters of it, and they've pumped it up properly. It is properly pumped so that they have a very, very uh, decent amount of horsepower and torque coming out of it. And uh, I've, j I've just driven it about nine feet so far. So, <laughs> But if, if my experience with uh, other vehicles on the, in the BMW line that have an engine very similar to this, I'm expecting it to be a very smooth runner, and we'll find out together further along in this video. So what else? What else? Well, I don't see the battery anywhere. Hmm. Hmm. Is that it over here? Yes. Uh, there is a red, uh, as you see, a plastic cap there for your jump starting, should it be necessary. So I'm assuming the 12 volt battery is underneath there, but I don't know this for sure. BMW is very fond of putting it in the back of the car sometimes, all for weight distribution, because Let's face it, those lead acid batteries are still, to this day, very, very heavy. So that's our, that's our way on this BMW. And man, we got all kinds of little structures up here. And here's something that you don't see very often that's kind of fun. Now normally, 
See, here's our beautiful uh, kidney grill, uh, kind of a uh, trademark of the BMW line. Usually, right, right here is where we would find the hood latch, right? Well, look at this sucker. Now, this is ornate. What we have here is we have a hood latch here, whoop, and then we have a hood latch over here. And the hooks are up top on both sides. There's one, and there's one. So, so this hood actually secures on both sides, there and there, instead of just central one central hood lock. Why? I don't know, but it's typical German engineering. It's absolutely vastly stronger than a conventional system, I'm sure, because you have twice as many locks on it. But isn't that interesting? Well, it just did something. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? I may have mice. No, I think that was a something closing itself. There, oh. There, do you hear that? What the hell's going on here? I love it. It's, it's, just, it's just modern electronics doing their thing. Nothing to be afraid of, I don't think. Okay, now then, Lexus. Hello, Mr. NX350H. Boy, these grills, I mean, look at that. Does that look evil? Does that look wasp-like? It's interesting looking. I like the color, too. Um, here, look. Uh, just one central latch, this is what I'm talking about, and there's your hook up there. Uh, here we have a beautiful hybrid power plant. Very common in the Toyota Lexus line. This is a 2.5 liter inline four, also mounted transversely. And as is typical uh, Lexus Toyota hybrid function, we have our four cylinder right here. One, two, three, four, four cylinders, and over here, is our electric bits. This is our front motor one. And there are, there's another motor. There's motors that are actually uh, associated with the transmission. And it's, it's called an ECVT. And it is a continuously variable unit, but not a normal conventional uh, type of unit like that. It doesn't use belts and stuff. It uses electric motors. And it's not as complicated as I'm kind of making it, as I'm implying that it is. It is, and they're very, very reliable, but it is primarily an electrically powered system, which is why, and I always like to point this out, that even though you have a gas engine and you have electric motors and the vehicle can be propelled on either and both, and is always running under a mixture of both usually, but it can run solely electric or solely gas. But if you have an electrical problem, you can't run on just gas by itself because the transmission has to have an electric supply that I think is primarily done by the hybrid battery itself, which on this vehicle is a lithium ion unit, not a nickel metal hydride, which makes me sad because I'm a traditionalist. But we have no turbocharging on our 2.5 liter. This is a conventionally aspirated unit. And here is our intake. Says, look at how clean this is, by the way. Uh, this is this is unfair to the BMW <laughs> because this is a, a 2024 model and our X over there is a 2023. So this is hot out of the uh, out of the Lexus supply line and the fleet companies that handle these uh, press vehicles do such good work. They really really do, but they can't detail the engine every time. <laughs> They don't have the time to do that. They would if they could, I guarantee you, because they do such a good, great job, actually, with everything else. But this is so new, we actually get to see it in its pristine state, which I am very grateful for, because I always love seeing these things when they're so new. This is, this is one of the joys of ownership if you buy a new car. You can, you can take it home and just stare at it for hours. But in the usual uh, Lexus hybrid fashion, there are no fan belts running anything. The power steering is electric. The fuel pump is, well, fuel pump. Of course, the fuel pump's electric. But it has a series of oil pumps in it, I believe, if it's like most of the other hybrid, uh, current model hybrid 2.5 liters, in that uh, it, it literally, there's so much devotion with a hybrid of bringing the t engine up to temperature as quickly as possible. All engines do that nowadays anyway, because that's how you reduce emissions, is the, it, the faster you can get the uh, in internal combustion engine up to speed and up to temperature, the lower the emissions 
ultimately are because they're, they're really nasty and dirty when they're cold. So to help that process, uh, there's different ways that the oil pumps work on this car and it doesn't start to circulate oil in certain areas that are normally used to cool the oil until it comes up to a decent temperature and then those areas open up and all this is controlled electronically. And it works great and it's very reliable. I mean, Toyota, know, they know what they're doing, folks. They've been doing this a long time. So uh, it, this is a very, very sophisticated engine. And then you have all the electric bits. This huge thing that looks like an alien's uh, got its maw on it. It's gonna put a ovipositor down the throat of the engine. That's just electrics. And that is to tell you and the fire department and anybody else that might be interested <clears throat> in the event of a collision where your electrical power is and should be avoided. Although the systems they have nowadays for shutting everything down are amazing and uh, this like all these other Toyota 2.5 liter hybrid engines and the regular 2.5 liter it's a direct injection engine but it also has port fuel injection not sure about the BMW if they do it this way but this engine runs on both and it depending on the operational conditions one is better than the other as far as fuel economy power and lower emissions uh, sometimes direct injections better and sometimes uh, the old conventional type of flow, what I call flow through, that nobody calls it that, <clears throat> but it's, it's a wonderful system when you have both because the, one of the downsides to direct injection is carbon buildup uh, because the, the uh, fuel is directed directly, is injected directly into the cylinder and it avoids all the valve train. And one of the things fuel does when it goes through the uh, valves is it helps to clean the carbon off. Well, if you have a regular fuel injection that actually is port injected, that's what most normal people call it, uh, that cleans off, it, it goes in through the air intake, so that goes over the, the uh, valves and cleans the valves and keeps everything clean. But there's more to it than that because there's, they've actually discovered through all their research and time that it's actually good some, under some circumstances to have port injection instead of direct injection. So when you have a system that has both, best of both worlds. And Toyota's been doing this for years now and it, it works quite well, as you might imagine. It uses that old uh, 016 oil and does not use this new 08 oil, <laughs> which I had on the, uh, you haven't seen it yet. Have you seen it? Which, which, which review will run first? I don't know. Uh, the Toyota Crown has a new hybrid engine that, in fact, uses 0 W8 oil. And the, I believe the Grand, Wa it's Grand Wagoneer, geez, the Grand Highlander, or the High Highlander Deluxe, or High, High, what is it? The Extra Long Highlander. The Highlander plus 5,000, 5, well, what it, what it is, I think it's the Grand Highlander. <laughs> but it has... It has basically the same engine as the Crown in it, the hybrid one does, and it uses the Zero W8 oil. Our, we're getting so thin on our oil, it's, it's phenomenal that these things can handle all that, but they can. We'll see, the only problem is getting some oil if you need some, so you should go to your dealer when you buy a new one, if you have Zero W8 oil, even, even if you have Zero 016, because it can be hard to find, Take a quart and put it in the back of your car somewhere just in case you need it. Odds are you will never need it between oil changes until you have like 500,000 miles on the car. So, but anyway, our numbers. I know you're, you're waiting with bated breath. Well, as you can uh, probably recall, we, with our uh, X1, we had 241 horsepower. This, well, the, uh, the gas engine puts out 189 horses by itself. But then with the electric motors, and there are two, there's uh, this one up here, and then there is one that runs the back drivetrain solely on its own, away from the no connection between this engine and the back drivetrain. It's a completely separate entity. That uh, particular motor in cahoots with this motor and the, and the uh, inline engine puts out 239 horsepower. So we have a whopping two horsepower difference in peak output for both of these vehicles. <clears throat> so from where I come from, that's the same. Wheelbase is the same, power output is the same. And that's why I'm comparing these two vehicles. <laughs>
has, like I said, nothing to do with the fact that they just happened to both get here at the same time. Is there any other questions you have? What, what's that in the back? Uh, where's our air cleaner? Yes, right here. Very easy to get to. Um, everything on this car is easy to get to. And like I say, you never have to change a belt because it doesn't have any. Everything is operated by electric motors that seem to be, from my experience, <clears throat> a very, very reliable way to do things on these hybrids from your friends at Toyota slash Lexus. Okay then. Continental, da -da 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 -da. here on our BMW wheels that are 19 inch. Well, anyway, uh, on our BMW, we have some beautiful Continental uh, all-terrain. All -terrain. I always do that, all season tires. And uh, these beautiful wheels and these massive brakes, all very typical of the brand. And uh, our tire size is 245-45R19. So we have 19-inch wheels. Uh, and what will it, how will this compare to the Lexus? Will it have the same tires? We shall see. But anyway, excellent Continental uh, rubber. As you can tell just while we're sitting here on the grass, there's not a whole lot of ground clearance to this thing, uh, which is going to turn out to pay benefits in terms of the handling. I know that for a fact. Uh, but as far as your off-road soirees, this is a very light off-road use vehicle if you do that. But like I say, snow, yeah, that'll definitely be something you can do with this thing. And there's our very nice square. Look at how much squarer this looks than this. This is much more of a fastback. Will that affect our cargo room back there? <laughs> oh, well, we're going to find out now, aren't we? So let's check this out. There's our X drive, by the way. That is what BMW likes to call their four wheel drive, all wheel drive system. And there's my notes and there is our moi. Now, this is a compact, so it's not vastly roomy, but it is roomy. And as you can tell from the seat up there, we have like a 40, 40, 20 breakdown to enhance the usability and utility of your X1. So you can fold those back in any increment you want almost. And put your skis through there or do whatever you'd like to do. It's very well finished in typical BMW fashion. Although, and this I want to talk a bit about this as we go on. There's a few oddball things about it that make this car feel cheaper to me than your average BMWs. And it is a, a, like the entry class, X1. I mean, if it was an X75, it would be like uh, $150,000 and, and have 700 horsepower. But anyway, what do we have in the way of spare? A beautiful temporary spare tire and all the fixings. Excellent. I love it. So, uh, unlike what we're going to see with the Lexus, this thing has a lot of room in it. Uh, and they, what they've done, which is very clever, is they really did by raising the rear line a little bit, making it a little squarer, they've actually increased the cargo room quite a bit. So how much is the cargo room? Well, when the seats are, are in the position they're in now, <clears throat> i.e. deployed, you have 25.7 cubic feet of space right before you. Now, if you fold all them seats down, all them increments, the 40s and the 20s and all that, it swells up to 57.2, uh, which is a very roomy, uh, for, for the size of this car, uh, the fact that it's pretty small. By the way, what's the length on this car? It's 177.2 inches, which is five inches shorter than the Lexus. So the Lexus is a longer vehicle. But as we shall now examine, let's compare the cargo area on this thing. Now we do have the swoopier back. It's just generally swoopier. And there we are. So as you can see it's a little wider but a lot flatter and <clears throat> definitely compromises the cargo room a bit having that fastback line but still just physically looking at the two it looks close. The numbers, however, are different as far as it, it seems like it's got less. I mean, they're using the same methodology, I assume, but uh, this says you have 22.7 cubic.
cubic feet of space with the seats deployed as they are and you fold them down and it's 46.9 cubic feet and you'll remember the X1 is 57 so there is more room in the BMW however it really doesn't look that way when you look at the cars it's kind of strange and another thing is the general quality of the finish in the BMW <coughs> excuse me in the Lexus is definitely better and the uh, oh I didn't even realize it had this you push that it's electric it won't move at the moment because I got something going on up there I got something going on up there <coughs> but in general, generalized speaking, it just generally seems much, much wider than the uh, BMW and much better finished. It's like a, a higher level of, and the BMW, granted, is cheaper, is a lot cheaper. Well, is it a lot cheaper? It's about 20% cheaper, yeah, but it feels cheaper. Now, here's what I don't like. There ain't no, uh, we ain't got no spare tire. Ain't, we got a lot of storage. But we ain't got no flat repair kit either. We got nothing. First aid, which is excellent. And I always have to say kudos to Lexus about this. But all this car has is run flat tires, which I've always been uh, less than fond of personally. But that's it you, uh, on this particular. And this is the luxury model. So maybe there's something different. I've contacted Lexus to find out, but... Uh, I think you ought to at least have a flat repair kit, and, and at least, but I think there's room underneath there if you wanted to. You could put a temporary spare. But I guess they've done their focus groups, and they've said, oh, no, I never, I, do you think I'd get out and I would actually change the tire? Are you mad? So I think they're just expecting people to, uh, to pick you up. And I didn't even see this particular vehicle doesn't even have a tow hook that you screw in so they can put her on a flat bag when you have a flat and take it in some place to get the, the situation rectified. But that may just be, uh, it may be this particular unit. It, it's supposed to have one and just doesn't because of it's a fleet unit, so. But anyway, I've, I've contacted Lexus about this because I'm, I'm a stickler about spare tires, as you may have noticed. I think you ought to have one, some kind of way to keep going so you can get to work on time or get to the hospital when the babies do or something and you shouldn't be sidelined by just a flat tire and but w these are strange times we live in and everybody just expects I guess just expects to call the auto club but I don't need to tell you if you've experienced with all the auto clubs there are so many reasons why it can sometimes take them forever to get to you now then oh let's talk about wheels and tires instead of Continentals we have Bridgestones you know, Bridgestone is more of a Japanese company and Continental is more of a German company or that used to be the way it is. And so it is fitting that one would have a German and the other would have a Japanese tire. <laughs> and I don't even know if that's necessarily true. They're built all over the world now. So these, but both of these tires may be built in America for all I know. Uh, but this is a run flat Bridgestone. And our tire size is 235.50 R20. Whoa! So we got bigger wheels, 19s on the X1, 20s on the Lexus. So, and they also are, of course, all season. Now you like that, I didn't say all terrain by mistake. Uh, the discs don't look quite as big, but the calipers are definitely big monsters. And uh, of course, one of the lovely things about having a hybrid is uh, you have regenerative braking, which helps Basically, among other things, to preserve your brake pad light, a life because that helps with some of the braking. And what do these things weigh, by the way? Well, the uh, X1 is 3,700, excuse me, is 30, wait a minute, is this right? It says the X1 is 3,700 pounds, curb weight, and it can tow 3,700 pounds. I don't think I've ever encountered that before. I'll double check that. If I have to correct it, it'll be at the bottom of the screen, but I think that's actually right. Now the Lexus, on the other hand, weighs 4,080 pounds. So it's heavier and it can tow 2,000 pounds. I think I mentioned this before. Uh, would you really tow anything with any of these things? I mean, they're little. Anything that weighs anything. Other thing, a utility trailer, sure, you could do that. But anything beyond that, I think you're kind of, 
you're being silly. If you tow something that actually weighs 3,700 pounds with this little X1, uh, I see swaying in your future. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it tows like a dream. But anyway, there we have it. That's uh, the nuts and bolts of the basics of these two very, very interesting and very useful vehicles that are trying to vie for your affection and also luxurate you. <laughs> Which one of these is more luxurious, is more comfortable, rides smoother, is quieter, is more refined? Well, we'll, we'll get to that very shortly. And I'm going to also throw something else in. I hate the doors on both of these cars. I hate the door, specifically the door latches, because they both have things about them that I do not like. The latches on the doors, this is all about latches. The BMW's got them twin hood latches on it. And how did we get into this latch conundrum? I don't know, but let's move on and examine the interiors. X-Man. I am an X-Man. Well, I am while I'm sitting in the X-1. Uh, interesting little car. This thing, I got to tell you all right off the bat, this is something I find fascinating. Uh, if memory serves, the first SUV that uh, BMW put on the, on the uh, market was the X-5. And now we have an X-7 and an X-3. And this little guy, the entry level, the smallest of them all, the X-1. Now, instead of uh, just doing like a scaled down version of the X5, the X1 is really its own thing. It, 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 everything on this car is uh, unique to the, to the uh, pretty much, I mean, there's some common stuff, of course, but a lot of things on this car, let us say, are very unique to the X1, and a lot of them are baffling than all get out. And there's a... I've never spent more time in a car that I'm reviewing. And like I said, I've been doing this for a couple of decades uh, that I had to spend more time just figuring out how to get around. There was a Mercedes SL convertible about 12 years ago that took me for, it took me over an hour to figure out how to set the clock because the clock was off. That's a long story. And uh, usually with the Europeans, Manufacturers, for some reason, they a lot of times they have no. I'm looking here. There is no owner's manual. So you're on your own if you're a journalist. So you have to try to figure this stuff out, and eventually you break down and you you contact the manufacturer and they'll help you. But and the car, believe me, the car comes with an owner's manual. And this particular one doesn't have one, but it does have a. Uh, you can access the owner manual owner's manual through the apps in the car. But anyway. Uh, this is a really bizarre and interesting thing. Now, as you can see, this is kind of what I would consider to be the default instrument cluster. Now, can you change that? Can you do other things? Let me get my finger out of there. Sorry. Ah! Boy, I tell you, what's going on with this? There we go. Um, you can. You can, in fact, change that. And what we'll do is we'll do this. And over on the right, and uh, there's our heads-up display. We can, oops. This is one thing about it. It does this very quickly. Heads up, content, and then you can go up and down with all this stuff. Look at all your, your variations. Well, shall, we, shall we interact, uh, put a variation in there? There, there's a variation. There it is. There's our navigation directly in front of us. Okay, let's go back. Content, let's go, uh, what the heck is that? Well, that looks like a... a G meter, yep, mm-hmm. And there's our tunes, uh, Nobody From Nowhere, Jimmy Buffett. Uh, that was on there earlier. Now, wait a minute, why, are they still playing that song? Wow, well, I do like that song quite a bit. Uh, gotta go back, sorry, here we go. And uh, so those are our choices here. This is uh, a compass, I guess. <laughs> it's an interesting looking compass. Values since individual, ga uh, this is 0 0.3 gallons per hour. How many hours? You're, uh, wow, we have 12,455 miles on this thing? That's amazing. Or is that when we need service? I don't know. I have to dig into that. This car is designed to vex. And here's something nice and plain and regular. Now, there's another thing I want to do here. I want to... 
Oh, boy. I, I'd like to show you the different... Uh, how do I do this? Huh. Huh. I would like to be able to share with you the, the different themes that are available for your enjoyment. Um, but I can't seem to do it because there are multiple themes available. Let me do this. What, what happens if I do that? Uh, that didn't go well for us, did it? Okay, I'm trying. So if we go to the right, we go there. We go to the left, we go there. But content, I want to see, what I want to see is, uh, man, i tell you, this is exactly what I'm talking about. I, a few minutes ago, I did the first take on this. And I got lost in these menus because of this little thumb wheel. I'm going to go straight and just show you this thumb wheel because this is, this is your nemesis right here. Uh, it operates like this, okay? There is where you, you call up the initial settings right there. Then then you can go up and down with this one, or you can go left and right, or you can go left and right that way. So it's, it's, it's a myriad, a, a veritable plethora of stuff that you can do. Now, what happens if I hold it down? Anything good? No, nothing good happens when I just hold it down. Um, let's see there. Well, we can go over there. We, uh, no, we can't. Go over there. Content. <sighs> what happens if I do that? Now, earlier, when I, when, when, if you just hit it, it usually just, uh, changes your, uh, your radio stations and stuff, but... It's a mess. There are two or three themes. I want to show you these themes. How can I do that? Well, first of all, this particular one, this is your tachometer on your right side, left side, right side. Uh, no, it's power times 100. I don't even know what the hell that's supposed to mean. Uh, wait, wait, wait. What's that? We don't seem to have a tachometer anymore. Earlier, I had a tachometer up there, and now I don't know where it is where it's gone, or what it's doing. Maybe, maybe if I go over here to system settings, <laughs> see what I'm talking about, guys? This thing is a mess. I mean, I granted, I am not the sharpest tool in the toolbox here, but at the same time, I do fairly know what I'm doing when I do with most of this stuff. Driving displays, all right. Heads up display, no. Instrument cluster, yes. Now, if I come over here, what happens if I, if I activate it? Nope, still the same. Uh, control display. Let, let's, oops, sorry. What's that? Brightness at night, cockpit brightness at night, and the heads-up display. Brilliant. That doesn't tell me jack. All right, well, let's go back here. Uh, displays, doors, windows, drivers, set, driver settings. Nah. Autumn. Automate habits. I'm not automating nothing for you. Uh, connected store drive vehicle status. Well, I'm just wasting your time and mine. But the fact of the matter is there are three different themes. One of them has a tachometer at least. Um, there's got to be one of these. Things. I don't see it anywhere. I do not see it anywhere. I'll try system settings one more time. Notification sound, pop-up valley, parking mode. No, no. You're failing me. Oh, well. Anyway, I hope you like that particular theme because that's all you're getting on this particular demonstration. But there are a couple of others, and you can put a tachometer on there, but it'll take you a while to suss it out. I could look it up on the owner's manual right now, but we don't have that kind of time now, do we? No, we don't. So anyway, here's your little nemesis here. You press this, and it will access, access this right here. How you actually change your uh, formats, or also known as your themes, I did it earlier. I don't know how to do it now. So there you go. Left side, very simple and straightforward by comparison. Here we have our cruise control. Uh, there is a heads-up display, by the way, which I have on right now. I don't know if you can see that. 
it, it has a variety of things you can put on it. And naturally, what do I do? I turn the thing off. I'm going to do that right now and see how quickly, how long it takes me to do that. Go back to uh, interior lighting, exterior lighting. I do so enjoy this. Seat cover system setting. It's not there. I know for a fact it's not there. Wi-Fi connections displays. Thank you. Heads up display. Thank you. See how easy that was? Oh, that's good. That's done. All right. So what else is weird? Well, I'll tell you, we're going to migrate here. The, the touch screen is actually the most, con I would say, conventional of, of anything on this car. It's fairly explanatory. You got a home screen. You got an app selection. And the app selection is where you'll find almost all of the things you need to get to. Uh, like I was just mentioning, as far as uh, uh, your presets and a, bu oops, and, a, and a bunch of other stuff, as far as pertinent items on the car, including an owner's manual. So that's all in there for you. And how is the navigation, you may ask? Beautiful. It looks great. 3D. Very, very nice graphics, as always, as you expect from BMW. They always do that well. Okay, so as we go further south here, now this, believe it or not, is how we get in the gear. Engine start is down here. Don't know why. Here's our shifter. It's a little bar here that you, now we're in reverse. Yeah. Very nice reverse cameras, by the way, plus a 360 camera. There's cameras all over the thing, all over the place out there. Then we have drive and low. This, uh, also, of course, has a, uh, well, no, it doesn't. Oh, boy. Park is also down here. So you got buttons for that, and then a bar for this, and here's your cameras, which you can move around, turn on, turn off. Uh, this is your volume setting for your stereo system, and you punch it to turn it on and off because there are no knobs up there because... That's just not the way it's done anymore. Now this button here is interesting because I have no idea what it does. Oh, wait a minute, sorry. Yeah, this is uh, your driver assistance and drivetrain and chassis settings. So you have all these different things that are very, not a whole lot of difference, to be honest with you, where you get your big difference is your modes. And you have, uh, you have uh, efficient, expressive, digital art, uh, let's look at expressive. Ooh, and see, it does that all the way across the car. See, this is getting into uh, Genesis territory, but this vehicle does not have a mood curator. But it does have this goofy ass thing. So, uh, I want to let's go over here and personal. I guess you could probably put your own photo in there. Balance settings and personal ambience. Are they showing a very, very angry person? And now, look what I have now. I have attack now. Oh, boy. You can just spend the rest of your life figuring out this car. Figuring out all your modes. Your moods and mode. Efficiency. That's me. That's very German. Look at there. It looks like some kind of a... Do you ever see a Forbidden Planet? If, if you look and you remember where the Krell had their labs, it kind of looks like that. But look, and you can almost see the creature from the id. There's the eyes. There's the mouth. Oh, my God. See what this card does to me? It just, like, messes me up. Um, what else do I need to show you down here? I think that's all the important pertinent items on here. And in further weirdness, we have our console here. And if you open your console, how, did I, how do I do that? I forgot how to do that. Oh, it's here. You press this. And there's almost no space whatsoever. <laughs> there's enough for this, uh, but it doesn't have a, a conventional... Uh, oops, that didn't even fit back in there. Look at that. Uh, it doesn't have your conventional cubby of storage beneath there. What it does have is underneath there, there's like a tray. And I don't... I thought you could lift that up. You can't. I don't think. No, it's fixed. So you have this weird little bridge, and you have this weird little space down here. 
Then you have your cup holders. This makes a little more sense. Then you have your USB-Cs and then your power port right there. And, and then you have your uh, area to put your cell phone. I would put mine in there and demonstrate whether or not it works with a case on it. But I left the cell phone in the house. It's brand new. I got a new phone, and it's identical to my old phone. How about that? That sounds like something I would do, isn't it? So, uh, what else have we got to show you up front? We have our uh, panoramic roof, which is an excellent panoramic roof. Uh, and the shade control is right here. So here comes our shade coming in. And then you stop it like that. And if you want to open the whole thing, keep pressing it. And then it'll open this. Uh, I think it'll open this. Yep, there you go. See, a very, very nice sunroof because there's a lot of space there. Look at that. that. For such a small car, that's a very big roof. I think that's terrific. I like that. And you can put your uh, sunglasses in your sunglass holder up, except they does not have one, so you can't. We have our dome lights. Very nice. And how big is it? glove box since we have no storage in this thing uh it's actually big the glove box and it's deep and it's well illuminated uh, by the way our sound system is uh harman kardon i wonder if i could actually uh now what happens if i hit this thing now what is it going to tell me it's going to yep here we go bar with a pool in it so the default position for most of this when it's in this particular setting is uh, audio. But if you want to do something other than audio, you press that and you get in that. Your, there's your old friend content again. And uh, I mean, I'm going to wrestle with this for the rest of my life. It's just, uh, it is what it is. And what it is is different. Okay. So how about these seats? The seats are very, very comfortable. You have a ton of headroom. Uh, the belt line is sort of, there's our Lexus. Hi. Hello, NX350H. Uh, belt line's kind of high, but not excessively high. Uh, overall visibility is pretty good. You got a beautiful uh, Harman Kardon sound system, which sounds like Harman Kardon sound systems always do. It sounds terrific. Uh, you have, now, what are these seats made out of here? There's the, we have, uh, we, do we have heating and ventilation? Hell, I don't know. Oh, that's something else I didn't even really get in here. You have to press that to get into your climate menu. And there it is. And you do have heating. And no, you don't have cooling, which is surprised me because these are perforated. But then again, this is, uh, as far as a full equipment standpoint, this is a BMW that doesn't have as much as a lot of them do. What do I mean by that? BMWs are very, very strange. When you look at them, if you were to go to a BMW dealership, uh, they, they have all kinds of equipment packages and non-packages and individual options that they put on BMWs. And you can, you can load a car up like you wouldn't believe with all kinds of stuff. Now, the X1 being sitting in the low, low end of the totem pole, as it were, doesn't have as many options available as some of the other cars and some of the other uh, SUV series, the Xs, if you will. But it does have a lot of stuff on it, as is equipped for this particular road test. And uh, it keeps the price down for a BMW. It's really, this is actually uh, an affordable car, comparatively speaking, in the BMW line. Uh, it's about almost 10 grand cheaper than the Lexus that I'm comparing this car to. So, uh, and that's nice, and it does have a lot of stuff in it, but it's missing some things too. Like, a, 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 you know, like an instrument cluster that makes any freaking sense. Okay, anyway, where were those? Oh, yes. What are our seats made out of? Uh, I believe they are, in fact, this being an X line, because uh, this is an X drive 28i, which simply means it has the two liter engine and it does have uh, all wheel drive, the uh, X drive system. But it's also just an X1. It would still be an X1 even if it didn't have X drive. You see, you see what I'm saying? Uh, interior trim, perforated, 
perforated, perforated sense tech. Obviously not leather, but it sure seems like leather. I can't get over how well they're doing this, all these manufacturers these days. You would swear that is leather. Uh, <clears throat> and the number of adjustments in these seats is excellent, and the uh, lateral support is great. They're really good seats, especially for this somewhat entry level status all right let's get out of here and get get to the back uh, uh, uh. Uh, now then uh, ooh. little door it's a comparatively small door uh, and it opens about 82 uh, degrees and <clears throat> as we climb in we do have an abundance an abundance of headroom and <clears throat> it's really strange. You have a decent amount of legroom and a decent amount of footroom, although there is a drive shaft, <clears throat> excuse me, a drive shaft tunnel. But it's not huge. It's not like so many sedans are. That's one of the good things about the BMW SUVs is they don't have the tend to not have the enormous drive shaft tunnels that the cars do. Their sedans are famous for their drive shaft tunnels. <laughs> but anyway, the car feels it's very strange. You got this beautiful panoramic roof, right? Then you got um, a decent amount of uh, leg, and leg room and tons of headroom, but it doesn't feel real roomy back here. And it's, in other words, it's actually much roomier than the ambiance makes you feel. It, 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 it's, it's not claustrophobic at all, but it's very strange. It's like everything else on this car. It's different. And uh, you could get three people in here. Yeah, but two people would be, I think, fairly comfortable. But a lot of it may just be the fact that the the door the difference between the the side well I can't even put it into words the fact that the door is small may have something to do with it it just gives you this feeling like it's more cramped back there than it actually is it's actually it's it's reasonably roomy especially for its compact dimensions now does our uh, oh great someone's turned the damn ah. Let's go together. They always have to, they always have these rear windows turned off. Why is that? There we go. Boy, this is the slowest rear Wow, look at there. So that's only about 90%, 92%. And boy, are those slow. Huh. That's just a X1 thing, ladies and gentlemen. You have your nice little LED light to illuminate your... Uh, and something I got to talk about, because I'm really going to hammer it on the uh, Alexis, but the door handles, especially in the front, I don't know how to describe it other than to say it feels cheap for a BMW. It, it's, it's just something about how it feels like it flexes a little bit or something. The back feels better. But I did notice that, and I, I ended up, when I was first working with both these cars, since I'm comparing them to each other, the fact that I really didn't like either of the doors uh door handles <laughs> which is something i normally don't spend a lot of time on but i did notice it it did it it, it got my attention that i didn't like either one of them and I, uh, it'll be easier to explain why i don't like the lexus but the bmw is just it's a pure it's a it's a design workmanship combo that it just doesn't feel as solid to me as your typical bmw i mean because let's face it they're Build quality is usually incredibly good with the highest quality components and really solid construction. This doesn't feel cheap, but it doesn't feel it to the same level that you get with other BMWs. So uh, we have our, our, uh, our storage areas here for your laptop, excuse me, for your uh, iPad or your uh, Android tablet, or uh, if you should encounter a magazine or a newspaper i mean wow you you're you've got a time machine apparently uh, you could be doctor who you could be in the tardis uh, and that's how you found these items but you got two usb-c ports nice little ventilation here and uh this panoramic roof is is i i bet it would really seem claustrophobic back here just in terms of how it seems not the actual room uh, if we didn't have this beautiful panoramic roof, because it really makes it airier, it helps. So there you go. Uh, this is probably one of my top 10 worst 
uh, descriptions of an interior by me and it's simply I, I blame myself but the problem is this car is really confusing in a lot of ways it is the most one of the most counterintuitive vehicles I've gotten into for a long time all that means is that you will have a longer period of time familiar familiarizing yourself with the vehicle and once you own it for a while you'll look at me like I'm some kind of an idiot and say everything's perfect on this car everything it's the easiest interface I've ever seen in my life it's totally like it's an extension of my brain but as for right now uh, I think it's a little bit of a mess it's a beautiful and fun and colorful mess but it's a mess <laughs> Still adjusting, still adjusting. It's amazing about a lot of German cars is it takes me forever to get the seat adjusted properly for me. And I think that's because there are so many adjustments offered. <laughs> that's a bad thing about having a lot of adjustments sometimes because you know what you can do? You can just mess with it and mess with it. I think a little bit more of this, a little bit more uh, recline, that'll be good. So here we are. We're on this uh, we're on this rugged trail here with uh, our little friend, the X1, and uh, so far the suspension's good. This is the first time. Usually, I, I haven't driven the car as much when I take this on this particular uh, type of vid section. Uh, this one, I, this is the farthest I've been. You just drove with me, so we're gonna find out together what this is like. And it certainly scoots, I'll tell you that. I'll tell you what. Um, there we go. Uh, it's funny. I, I am an immediately, one of the things that, uh, God, even the mirrors are way off. Uh, one of the things about this, it, it reminds me immediately of, is, this is a, a surprise, actually. The CR, a Honda CRV. It, it feels like the... Uh, Riding position is a little more upright, and you're sitting up higher, so you can see out of it. It's also a kind of, you can. This is one of those moments where you can tell it's related to the uh, X5 BMW because BMW uh, that X5 is like that. Very short hood, you can see over it. That's one of. The, I think that's one of the appeals of this car when people first test drive one, is that you can really see out the the rear, not so much, but the front, the side. It's pretty good, and that's extremely important I don't care what you're driving you really need that and I love it when manufacturers manage to accomplish said goal alrighty then they've done an amazing job with this uh, twin power turbo system the way it actually works I believe it there is only one turbocharger there are some four-cylinder engines that have two turbochargers and you, what the way it works is two cylinders feed into one of them and the other two cylinders feed into a different one. With BMW they, they do things a little differently. They uh, have a system whereby there's veins if I understand it that direct the, the exhaust flow to the uh, exhaust turbine in different places at different times so that it you get the benefits of having a low speed turbocharger and a high speed turbocharger too. But if that makes any sense, I would best describe it as the fact it's such a much smoother flow of power than you get with a lot of turbocharging. They've really done a great job. And they've been working, BMW's been working on this for a long, long time and they never sleep as far as, they're one of those companies that's constantly tweaking stuff. A lot of times you will see a, uh, a model like this is like they I basically described this. This is a 2023 model. I believe they described it as a uh, carryover from 2022. But they still, I'm absolutely certain, they tweak everything every year <laughs> a little bit. Just to, you know, so they figure out, well, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? And it makes a difference. And it makes the, uh, makes the vehicle 
better than it was before. So I give them, I say kudos to that. And I really like the suspension so far too. It, uh, it's firm, but it's well dampened. And that bodes well for spirited driving on the pavement as well as light off-road work. This is good. This is a good thing. I've uh, I have through my research <laughs> materials, also known as this enormous uh, owner's manual portfolio device thing. Uh, ah, get in, get get in, get in there. Ah, <clears throat> I have found out something. No, really. See, there was this thing up here. Uh, Shall I show it to you now? I'll show it to you now. That, this, here. And it says, uh, you know, it's got an on off switch and, and it's got a microphone and it's got Bluetooth and it's got SD card reader and action. See, I didn't know that was an SD card reader either. Uh, what is it? What the hell is it? Uh, it's, a, it's a dash cam. It's a camera that you can uh, record everything you do when you uh, are escaping. Uh, to, if you're running to the border or something, and you need to, uh, you need to record later that the uh, the aliens were attempting to overturn the vehicle, and uh, you filed a lawsuit against them with the new overlord, and uh, you got your footage. You can show that they tried to turn over the car. <laughs> well, anyway, but for those of you that are into dash cams, that is incorporated into the car. So uh, there you go. That's my first to see that. Uh, there's a lot of things on this car that are like that, that I'm going to go why, but it's fine. I'm sure it's a great thing to have if you're, if you really want to uh, keep track of anything bad that happens that you can have. Well, anyway, you figure it out. You know, <laughs> I don't know. Well, anyway, welcome, welcome to the inside of the Lexus. RX. No, not RX. It's smaller. NX 350H, which is a hybrid. And as you saw earlier, it has a four cylinder engine, 2.5 liters, and electric motor array and a rear power. Here's our diagram. <coughs> Here's our engine. Here's our front drive system. Here is uh, that thing there. <laughs> That's. That's part of the, the uh, motor that starts the, that could be the transmission actually. It's got an electronic continuously variable transmission, but as we all know, that means there's a lot of motors in there. But it, it, it is a CVT in that it, it has a continuously uh, variable ratio system. Uh, here is our battery right here. In this case, it is a lithium ion. And here is our rear motor and our rear drivetrain. So that's what we have for our drivetrain. And this is our uh, cockpit and our instrument cluster. Now, one thing that just makes me so sad with this car right off the bat is uh, if you may go back and look at some of my other Lexus videos, they used to have like a regular mechanical speedometer that would be right there. And you had this button you would press and it would slide over to the side to reveal a uh, trip computer. But no, they, they don't do that on this one. And that, unfortunately, probably means they don't do it on the others either, which is a shame because I really liked it. I thought it was cute. But so there we have uh, our, our main cluster. And as you can see, it's a digital speedometer. Our average uh, miles per gallon is displayed at the moment. We can do all kinds of things. This is uh, very similar to one of the last Lexus models I had. And I hate this. Uh, this little multi-directional display here. Uh, there's your mode to decide which mode you're in for your cruise control. You can have adaptive or or non-adaptive or whatever. Uh, but the thing about this is uh, you have to hit the right things in order to, like if you want to adjust your following distance, you got to slide over and hit it there. 
and it's a pain, and I'm I'm forever being lost. And this is uh, I don't know what that is. Oh, display, driving support, blank, G four G forces. Want to see G forces? Let's let's see. Can we do that? Wait, go back to G forces. I don't know how to do that. It it I know how to select it, but I don't know how to make it do its thing, because it apparently. Okay, no. But so, do you see why I don't like this? It's a, it's it's a pain. It 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 it's not easy, intuitive, or fast. And yeah, I'm about 175 years old. Oh look, EV driving range. Now that's neat. I have no idea how I actuated that, but uh, apparently there's a little button down here like that, and that one. I wonder what happens if you just hold it down, nothing. Then you go here and you go to display, energy monitor, and there it is. That's kind of cool. That's another way, that's another version of this, essentially, to tell you what's going on, what's driving what, and how much battery you have left. So that's good. We like that. Uh, how about energy, uh, how about, uh, oh, okay, we'll go this way. It's not doing anything, it's not going anywhere. Let's go up and down. We can't see. It's just not what I would describe as intuitive at all. Uh, how do I adjust that, guys? Come on. Up, down, left, right. Uh, uh, energy mine. Oh, that's how you do it. You have to punch it. Okay. I understand. Fuel consumption, driving support, blank, G-force. Now, that's the one I wanted to do. And there it is. I can watch my G's. My accelerometer, my braking, left and right, that's all there for those that are into that. Uh, you have that you have that available to you. Uh, and now what else do we have? We have uh, navigation, audio, energy monitor. We did that earlier. Okay. Now what happens if we go right display, audio, navigation, G-force? Let's put our G-force over on the right and see what happens. Uh, it looks the same to me. Uh, uh, eh. Well, anyway, as you can see, the flat screen rules all. There is no mechanical uh, sliding speed uh, speedometer anymore, uh, which is sadness. And oh, hey, what's uh, what's this over here? Well, this over here is uh, all audio oriented, right in here. And this will give you your mode, and like if you want to switch bands. Go to, go to your CD player. <laughs> Good luck with that. Doesn't have one. They're disappearing. They're almost completely gone, which is a shame because I like CDs. Too. I like all this old stuff. But there are some things on the Lexus Control Cluster that I do give a hearty approval of. One of which is that they still have just a regular switch so you can switch from uh, trip A, trip B, uh, when we have to do our next maintenance stop and uh, our total mileage, which is exactly 1,300 miles. This is a uh, 2024 after all, so this is brand, brand spanking. So that's the bulk of that. That's the bulk of your uh, instrument cluster. And, um, oh, there is uh, one other thing. Well, okay, now let's, let's venture over. Let's venture over to this huge, it is actually very, very big, uh, our touchscreen display. And it's, it's using Toyota's latest system. I've got it turned, uh, or adjusted rather, that it's in the nighttime mode all the time because the bright light of the daytime mode, I think, makes it really harder, much harder to read than what you're seeing before you right there. Um, we have all kinds of stuff here. All-wheel drive, look at there. This is a particular display that will tell you which wheels are working when. And again, with this... Uh, rear motor driving the rear drivetrain completely separate from the front engine driving the front drivetrain as well as the front motor driving the drivetrain. It uses mixtures of all this stuff. It uses the rear uh, more than you might think. It, whenever it's optimized, it's a, a way of optimizing your traction or even your fuel economy. Uh, it'll, it'll kick in the rear wheels so they're always there for you. It's like an instantaneous reaction thing which obviously is ex exceptionally good if you run into slippery situations because it's ready. It is so ready to help you. Our driving assist, 
this is uh, Toyota Safety Sense 3, I believe. Uh, I have much of it turned on. I have much of it turned off. Uh, this is the thing I hate most, which is proactive driving assist. And that's if they think you're going into a corner too hot, it'll put the brakes on by itself. And I just don't like that at all. A uh, lane departure alert. I hate that too because I have to leave the lanes where I live all the time for people walking their dog or people checking their mailbox or all kinds of different things like that. So that's, uh, that's not my way. Let's drop down into this menu here. And uh, uh, we have Bluetooth and devices general. What's in general? That's basically the screen more than anything else. Your Wi-Fi, your display. Now what about our display? Uh, we have, uh, come on now, come on now, screen display night time. Now where is, you know what I'm looking for, don't you? Yeah, you do. I am looking for, uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. yep, yep, yep. I am looking for the uh, heads up display because I was going to show it to you because I feel like I ought to, even though just because I hate it doesn't mean that you guys, you may think heads up displays are the most beautiful thing ever created by any automotive engineer ever. But me, I dunna like it. I dunna. So, energy flow. Now, I, I, don't, I have adjusted this. I have gone in to the menus, found it, and now I have to look again. It's like everything's turning more and more into like Volvos, where you really have to navigate your around to find stuff. Uh, and like I say, if you own the vehicle, I always keep saying this, but it's really true. Because something is not initially intuitive is not a severe problem, really, uh, unless you have family members that are just suddenly thrown into the car and they are like they're 17 and they're expected to know what's going on and they're going to be spending all their time. Look, I turned it off. Look at that. Um, and they're going to be spending all their time trying to figure out how to do basic things. And, and that's... You don't want that if while they're driving. Well, I would show you what the uh, well. Let's do this. I know what I know what we're gonna do. We do have our modes. We have a different way of doing things in two different areas, but they're more conventional. If you come down here, first of all, here is our climate control area. This is actually very easy to to access, and as you can see, the temperature zone setting is right there, and uh, you just touch this. Nothing happens. You hit climate. <laughs> And it helps you with all this stuff. You have a climate concierge, which adjusts comfort devices automatically by auto. Well, we have auto on, but I, I saw no concierge. But I'm sure there is one. Uh, heated and cooled seats. A heated uh, steering wheel. Excellent, excellent. Kind of what you'd expect at this price point with a Lexus. But it's there. It's absolutely there. Uh, so there, that's basically our climate situation. Here's... One of the few actual knobs on this vehicle is the uh, volume control and on-off knob for the audio system. Down here we have uh, the parking assist situation for if you want to park the car. I think, yeah, you know, I see these all the time and that's what I say it is. Uh, I am, I'm just an enemy of self-parking because I think they take too long and just learn to drive and you'll be in, you'll be in the restaurant while people are still backing the damn thing up using the cars and all their al algorithms. Here's our camera views. Now look there, we're doing spinning around, we got invisible car. This is one of my favorite things that uh, Toyota slash Lexus does, because I think this is cool. And what about that there? Well, we can do that. We can stop it, I think, here we go. Panoramic view monitor. That's what we were doing. Advanced park, what does that do? Is that what I was? Going back to what I was, uh, yeah, yeah, here's our, yeah, 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 yeah. Here's how we adjust all these parameters for the parking system if it's going to park the car for you. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll probably, by the time I get so old I can't park the car by myself, I shouldn't be driving anymore. That's my view. But that'll all change, you know. It'll get better and better and better and better and better, and pretty soon it's just going to be ridiculously good, so... Uh, View under vehicle. Now that this is one of my favorites right there. And let's uh let's go back there. And as you can see, you can uh 
you can see all the way around the vehicle. And what about, wait a minute, what, what about our, uh, our conventional backup camera when we put it in reverse? There you go. You have two of them. You have the, and they're both excellent. You have the uh, normal rear uh, backup camera, which is very clear, easy to understand. And then you have your 360 view here. And this is telling me that there's a tree right next to me. It's not lying. That is exactly what's over there. You can also do this. And that is kind of a more of a wide angle adventure. Or you can go back and get your, get your lines on there like this. Turn the wheel and nothing happens. What happens if I start to back up? What happens if I do that? Uh, no, it doesn't do anything. Okay, well, I don't know what them crossbars are for, but they're there for you. <laughs> for you to enjoy. All right. Now, now we're getting really interesting. Down in here is our area where we have our drive mode selection, or one of them, because there's actually multi-drive uh, mode selection situations. It's on normal right now. You kick it to the left, and you go on to Eco, and Eco shows up on our dashboard. Tiny, tiny cluster thing right there. It's just a little bitty. And then, let's go Sport, man. Now we're in Sport. Boy. You know, it's very quiet about it. It's very, very, you know, uh, this is a luxury car, so you don't want to make a, you don't want to make a fuss. You want to be more uh, erudite <laughs> in your declarations of mode. Um, and then we'll go back to normal. And then, but here, wait, I'm not done with that. You drop down here, and we have two modes here. We have your EV mode, which, of course, is electric vehicle mode, and it will stay on the battery power alone, powering it, uh, moving the car with the electric motors as long as it possibly can. And then once you're out of the sufficient, what they feel is sufficient battery threshold, then the engine will kick on. But that's great for things like drive-throughs. I always mention that. It's, it's the drive-through mode. And what's this here? This looks like an off-road mode. <gasps> there it is over here. You know, it's much better than the other ones because you see you got the car there, you got your little tree, and you got your... Uh, it's kind of like uh, <laughs> our good friend Bob. I think I'll put a little tree right here. And, and one of my favorite painters of all time. <laughs> and yours too, I'm sure. Okay, so that's that. Now how about our shifter? Well, we have a very nice shifter in that it, it feels mechanical, but it's probably largely electronic. It's very easy to select, and unlike the BMW, X1. Look at what we do here. We put her in drive, and I can kick it over to sport. And we have paddle shifters, and we have a number of attractive. We're, we're on S Sport 4 now. Uh, and six. It goes up to total of six speeds, and we decrease over here. De -de 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 -de. So when you go to S, it goes to sport, and it's the same thing as manual mode, as far as I know. Uh, but the thing is, this is great because I'm in an S like sport mode, manual shifting, but I still got my little tree off-road situation. I'll make it go away now. Whee! So, neat, huh? I mean, you got a lot, of, you got a lot, of, lot to play with here as far as your mode you're. Uh, uh, before I go any further, because I'll forget, um, I have a real problem with the doors on this car. And this is why. This little rascal right here. Now, that's how you open it. When you open it from the outside, and we'll do that with the rear, by the way. Hey, I know, man. Oh, I know it. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. There you go. Um, what we have here is this is completely electronic. To open it from the inside, you push it in like this. But what? Wait, I've driven into a pond again, and all the electrics have shorted out. Then you pull it this way, and you can manually open it mechanically. So my question is to Lexus is why? Why do we have that electronic? And, it, and from the outside when you're getting into the car, it just feels weird. I don't understand why, why more and more manufacturers are embracing this stuff. It makes it more expensive to build the car. It makes the car more complicated. And I can't see it doing absolutely anything of actual value. It's just something they can do. And I mean, they'll slap me down. They'll tell me what, it, what the reason why, but it, it just doesn't work for me, guys, at all. I think it's not a smart move at all. 
And I, I'm, I'm real curious as time goes by if it, it gradually disappears. It, they'll wait until enough people complain. If uh, owners, because they, they try to keep track of what owners like and don't like. And if enough owners come forward and say, you know, this is crap. I hate this electronic thing. They'll get rid of it. It'll be gone. It'll be history. And I was still th sitting here thinking about how in the world did I get that heads-up display to turn on and off? I don't even remember now. Uh, and I couldn't easily find it. It has to be somewhere in this driving assist. No, 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 no. No, no, it's not here. Well, hmm, I drive shop New York Fleet. They take they take exceptional care of me. Um, let's see here. It's not there. It's just not there. I found it earlier. Um, it's here. You can. I, if I pulled out the owner's manual, I could probably find it in about two minutes. It's a big owner's manual. That's why I say it would take me two minutes. Uh, so what else? Well, let's look here at our console. And our console is actually very, very deep and roomy. And throughout the car, you'll see this really excellent uh, workmanship. It's a typical Lexus in that regard. This one's even, if anything, in my opinion, Lexus is getting better. Because this feel, they, they used to have a feel to them that was not quite as solid as a lot of the European and it's not like it felt flimsy or anything like that. Uh, it was it was just great. What in the world is this doing this for? I'm going to put an X on there because... Shut up. Trying to take over. I didn't touch anything. He back off. Uh, they just didn't feel as solid as some other cars. And, and But like I said, they didn't feel tinny or flimsy or anything like that. But now this is a very, very solid feeling car. And... Uh, the suspension compliance and everything is excellent. It's just, you know, I, it's weird. I do have, granted, the BMW is an entry-level BMW, and it doesn't have a whole lot of options on it to, to dress it up more. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it just doesn't feel as solid and well put together as this car does. And that's, and I'm talking about a very high level. And the reason I'll tell you that is when I first got in the X1 and shut the door, the door handle just doesn't fit. I have, Both of these cars have door handles that I don't get along with. In the Lexus, it's just electronics. And with the X1, it just doesn't feel right to me. It feels like it's just bolted on there and <coughs> I don't know. It's been interesting because both of these cars are very fun to drive. And I think they both, you know, there's no question, especially since the BMW is like about 10 grand cheaper than this or eight grand or something like that. You'll see when we do our Monroe Uh They both feel like they're worth their price to me. I mean, they really are. They're very, very nicely equipped. The uh, panorama view uh, roof on this is excellent. It's still, the car is still really quiet. I haven't even had that thing closed at all. And on the highway, this is a very, very quiet car. And definitely beats out the X1 in terms of road noise uh, for whatever reason. I don't know why. So anyway, that's, uh, is that, oh, here's our uh, QI charger, by the way. And here's a little square storage area for uh, hmm, credit cards. I, I don't know what you'd put in here, but there you go. Then you have, as and very thoughtful. You have your uh, USB-C and your USB-A. So, I love the fact that manufacturers like Lexus and Toyota put uh, put both in because you have devices that use both, one or the other, I should say. So, there we go. Okay, <coughs> let's go out back, and I'm gonna demonstrate for you why I don't like these doors. See, I'm gonna come in here. It's just like an electric limpness. It doesn't feel like a genuine door. But again, you have this thing, you push it to activate the electronic side of things, and then you pull it out if you need a non-powered alternative. All right, there's a lot of room in the back of this uh, NX, quite a bit. And let's have a look at uh, 100% the window goes down. It feels small, this window. 
And yet, the back of this, you've got a lot of headroom and a lot of foot room and like not even a sort of like a drive shaft tunnel, but it's not a drive shaft tunnel because this doesn't have a drive shaft. But your leg room, your foot room, excellent. I mean, there, this is for the size of this vehicle, this is a very, very roomy back seat. It's nice and comfortable. The, it's got some very nice lower back support. And here we have an armrest that's probably, I would describe as at the perfect height. That is very, very nice, very comfortable. And look at here. Heated, 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 rear seat. The outboard parts, anyway. In case you, you can get three people across here, absolutely, no problem. Um, it just feels wider, much wider, this car, than the X1. And I think it is. I think physically it's wider. I mentioned before, it's about five inches longer. But look at, look at the, uh, look at there. You got your, uh, well, I guess you don't have individual map lines here. Uh, I can't find the individual. Well, here, but if you put this on, phew, looks like a spaceship. Yeah, oh, that's cool. Uh, LEDs, very bright, very good for reading. Um, and all in all, this is a really good back seat. Uh, I would recommend this car for people that want something compact and, and really need a, a, a roomy back seat, this is a real good choice because I don't know where they I don't know where they put everything. And you got to remember, this is a hybrid. Underneath us here, we have our hybrid battery. There's a vent should be over here. Yep, that's where they put them on uh, Toyotas. But uh, you know what this reminds me of? Hell, maybe it's built on a similar chassis. Maybe the same chassis. I haven't looked. But it reminds me of the back seat of the RAV4. And the RAV4 has actually got a very roomy back seat. I think this is more so, though. I think we got more room here. We have our T. And we have <laughs> our dash cam up there. Boy, that, that was really vexing me because I didn't really think that of all manufacturers, Lexus would put one of those cameras up there. But they did. They decided to do that. They wanted to do it. They did it. And that is, of course, I'm sure, an option. Because I had a, I, in order to figure out what it was, I had to find a supplement to the uh, owner's manual because it wasn't even listed in the regular owner's manual. And aha! Then the supplement, I discovered that there it is. So, anyway, this is the inside of your NX 350H 2024 Lexus. And, uh, God, I could just go to sleep back here. I'll, it's time for a nap. I think I will. <laughs> energy flow that's what I'm all about so as you can see from my hybrid system here we're using everything we're going to all four wheels right now primarily with 100% battery power although the engine was just on for a second you definitely feel like you're sitting in the car rather than or I should say to describe this better, in the seat rather than on the seat. You're more on the seat in the BMW, and you're more in the seat. This is more of like a sedan type of thing. And it has a very different transmission because this is a CVT, ECVT, ECVT.
current mileage average is 35. I think that is over the life of the vehicle. And this is the beauty of this. Uh, Lexus and Toyota still does this. They have very simple to access little switch right here to go from your trip meters to your odometer. To your next service, by the way, is only 1,250 miles on this thing. Very good. That's something that I really like. And again, as always, I'm, I'm, this is our first time out, just like with the X1 was. I'm just going in a different direction. It's almost the exact same time of day, give or take an hour and a half. And uh, right off the bat, this is a very nice ride, too. They both are. I sense that there seems to be a little less noise, road noise, um, engine noise and all that stuff. It's kind of a wash right now because the, the thing about the, the BMW is it has an enhanced audio system uh, boost of the exhaust, as far as I can tell, anyway. Uh, this car, on the other hand, does not have that, to the best of my knowledge. And you have the gas engine, the CVT transmission, and the electric power. So, it's gonna vary between all these things. And where is, there's our EV button, don't we love that? And here we have, what are we on? We're on normal right now. But you can go to sport, and you can go to eco. Now I tried to put the, uh, well, I'll put it on normal. <clears throat> I tried to put the BMW on a uh, more economical setting, which is not called eco, by the way. It's called uh, efficiency. And I, so you would think I would also do that with this, which I will in a little bit. I'll put it on the eco setting because I would assume those are analogous settings by different manufacturers, ultimately designed to increase fuel economy. But this being a hybrid, interesting thing, hybrid but with a bigger gas engine. However, the gas engine on this vehicle, the 2.5 liter, is not turbocharged, whereas the X1 has a smaller 2 liter inline 4, but it is turbocharged. And it has a whopping total output of 2 horsepower more than this one does. But I sure as hell can't try to different, tell the difference right off the bat. And uh, we will uh, examine very carefully the curb weights again. I've already done that. Oh, I don't have, I, I meant to bring the thing and I didn't, I didn't bring my my Monroney's, my specifications, my notes. I left them all at home. <laughs> and just like with the BMW, uh, the heads-up display is turned off. This idea that you never have to take your eyes off the road with a heads-up display is so inaccurate because you take your, you may have your eyes still pointing in the road, but you're not focusing on the road when you're looking at your heads up display. And that's a big deal, that's a big difference. But anyway, we are uh, scooting about. And there's our flow, we're flowing. Primarily a front wheel drive. Oh, something I didn't mention about the X1, which is stupid that I didn't mention this because it's very interesting. Both of these engines are mounted transversely. And normally I talk about that as a direct, if, if it's it's mounted sideways, so they have to take a right angle turn. However, if you have a system, whereas you have front wheel drive, it's more of a direct drive system when the engine is mounted transversely like that. Now, if it's mounted longitudinally, as it tends to be, inline cylinder engines tend to be on BMWs and Mercedes and Audis, uh, it tends to flow, it tends to be a rear wheel drive vehicle primarily with, if it has all wheel drive, the front drive is a supplement to the rear. The, and most uh, all wheel drive vehicles like this that have a transverse mounted engine, it's the other way around. Front wheel drive most of the time and then the rear end comes in when conditions ask for it. Well, guess what? The X1 is unusual in the uh, BMW line in that transverse engine, and yes, most of the time it's a front wheel drive vehicle, just like this is, but the system that drives the rear wheels on that is a mechanical system with a drive shaft going from the transmission back to the rear. 
And on this, it is completely separate from the front. It is has its own motor back there, and it drives the rear wheels separately. But it, when you're just tootling along on a nice, well-paved road, good traction, lovely day, like today, you're just going to be driving in front wheel drive as we are right now. But it's ready. This rear end is ready. And the thing about this being a hybrid is the hybrid motors are such, especially the back one, that when you coast, you get regenerative braking from both sides. You get it from the rear motor and the front motor. And then there's motors that are uh, associated with the transmission itself. So we're looking at, at you know two very similar vehicles, almost identical uh, wheelbases, and very different drivetrains. The engines are about the same. The output, like I said before, is only two horsepower difference. That's a wash. I mean, you'll get individual variation from vehicle to vehicle where this may actually have one horsepower more than the particular X1 you're testing. They're not all exactly the same. That's with, and that's what happens with just about anything, especially anything that's powered by an internal combustion engine because there's always tiny little variations per unit. Here's a mystery. I note in my notes that the uh, Lexus NX 350H has the exact same wheelbase. Hear that echo? Isn't that interesting? I think that's coming from the, uh, this, this right here. Exhaust. But anyway, <clears throat> as I was saying, I've noticed that the Lexus NX 350H has the same exact wheelbase as the Toyota RAV4 hybrid. Hmm. How is this possible? Well, because one's based on the other. That's my, that's my conclusion. And you can look at it and decide for yourself which is which. I mean, uh, did the Lexus, this beautiful car, Look at how clean everything is. It has very few miles on it. Uh, was this based on the RAV4, or did they design this car first and base the current RAV4 generation on this one? Uh, I don't know. Does it matter? Not really. But the fact of the matter is they both have uh, a very, very similar everything. <laughs> uh, especially the rear suspension, while we're looking at right here. And... Um, it's a very sturdy, yet lightweight type of suspension. And I uh, got my device here. Uh, right there, this is our uh, leading link right here. It's attached via this beautiful piece of aluminum. Uh, so that's your front back link, if you will. And this one here is a lateral link right here. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And then we go further back. And here we have yet another link, and this is the link that houses our coil spring, which is right in there. And what is this right here? There seems to be a connection of some sort that's electrical. Well, huh, what in the world does that do? Because there's this little guy here. See, back here you got the bigger guy, which is the uh, anti-sway bar right there. Right, that's right. Oh, there, yes, there it is. And uh, But this little guy is attached to this very, very slender link. And what the heck does it do? Well, is it on both sides? Let's have a look. No, it's not on this, uh, this other side right here. Now that is fascinating. So what does that thing do? Well, it may be some kind of a potentiometer that is giving information to the car about what the rear suspension is up to. Uh, that's what I think this is for. And that tells it possible shop dampening uh, changes. Uh, I don't know. 
I'll have to dig into this. And then I probably won't have the answer in time for the video. Oh, gosh. All right, I'll just tell you this. Car rides great, and it handles great. It's a, it's a very, very comfortable, smooth riding vehicle that you might consider should be in the luxury class. And it is. So there you go. So moving on, this is our rear drive system. And this great big thing right here, underneath that, and you can see it there, is our rear electric motor. Motor 2, I believe it's called. I'm not, not positive about that. But as you can see, uh, in there, right there, is part of our orange. And here's some more of our orange. And so ultimately, the orange goes into the uh, electric battery, the lithium ion battery, uh, for its, uh, it feeds that motor that drives the rear wheels and is completely autonomous from the front drivetrain. So it's, uh, it's doing its own thing all the time and it's constantly measuring the traction and slippage situation. And, and more than that, it also, uh, there's just times when these, uh, when the hybrid all wheel drive system just senses that it would be better to provide some rear wheel uh, input and not just front drive input as most of these vehicles have a front drive bias and then they switch over to all-wheel drive and activate the rear when they feel the traction conditions demand it. But they're getting more and more complicated and sophisticated all the time and using that rear wheel system, rear drive system for all kinds of other things just to uh, aid general handling on smooth roads is a big part of it. Smoother takeoff from a standing start, all kinds of things like that. Now, what else do we have here? We have a little skid plate there, we have a little skid plate there, and I believe these are polycarbonate. That one might be metal. Yeah, I don't know. And then that runs all the way up front, and here is our uh, front suspension, which is also pretty sturdy. Uh, this is a luxury vehicle, but it's also an all-weather type of uh, drive system luxury vehicle active lifestyle wagon so it's built to take some punishment just like dare i say it the rav4 um, but again you have this when you compare a toyota to a lexus and the two are, are sharing some basic design architecture and things like that you'll always discover that the lexus goes a little further uh, in terms of fit and finish, in terms of the quality of some of the components. And that's why a Lexus costs a lot more than a Toyota, believe me. They, uh, they spend money on it to make it better, and that's why the cost difference. So there you go. Um, I can't get over the beautiful shine of that nice, uh, clean uh, spring. Now, I could show you a shot of our rear suspension on our vehicle. Uh, and how dirty it is <laughs> and the fact that it looks the same but I'm not going to bother just trust me when I tell you we do have this uh, this is a polycarbon this is just kind of a protective thing for the rear uh, suspension components that this is the lowest aspect the lowest part of the rear suspension is that lower control arm so they put some plastic on it in case you do go off-road a bit uh, I don't know how much abuse it can take, but it could take some. And you have a mixture uh, with the underside of this car. What surprises me is it's not really as smooth as I've come to expect from most Toyota hybrids uh, underneath the car because uh, that's becoming more and more popular way, especially with vehicles that are slightly higher off the ground, to uh, maximize your fuel economy. And also, if it, if it was a full electric, same thing as far as maximizing your aerodynamics under the car, because the underside of the car can be a drag fest if you don't have some of these covers in place to uh, cover all the components and just generally smooth, smooth it out like that. So that's what this vehicle does. It smooths it out. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's very different from what we're about to behold, which is our uh, BMW X1 which is in the same class of vehicle, a luxury compact uh, sport utility sort of actually crossover. These are both crossovers because this is based on the RAV4 chassis, which is based on their, one of their main 
component chassis that I think they use on uh, Toyota uses on quite a few vehicles now. It's all about the uh, economics of scale, you see. Now, I'm real curious about this guy right here, this little thing. I think that's just measuring. I think that's just giving information to your uh, to your CPU, your uh, computer production uniform. Uh, no, that's not what it stands for. Uh, it's your main computer that runs everything. That's just all you need to know. All right? All right, let's have a look at that Beamer now. Beamer, sorry, Beamer. Aluminium. Well, we're X1-ing. And what have we discovered? We've discovered many things. The, uh, the subframe that is holding up most of the rear suspension uh, appears to be this big, primarily this big aluminum structure which is beautiful and I'm sure no doubt lightweight and highly resistant to corrosion uh, but in all honesty I find much of this baffling back here it is baffling me but we have uh, as usual as is a uh, typical practice we have our multi-link set up for our rear suspension uh, very different, uh, very, very different than the uh, LX350H Lexus. Uh, both in materials and in execution, they just do things very, very differently at BMW. And uh, we do have this uh, protective structure, which ha has something here. I don't know what day it is. But our leading link is here. Goes up in there. And then there's this other what I would call your torsional link, your side-to-side -side link. And then uh, we have, where are the springs situated, you ask? Well, uh, this is a very different setup. This is almost like a, a rear, I actually have to go over to the other side here. Um, there is our shock absorber. So where in the gosh darn dickens? Oh, here we are, we're all the way up here. Wow, look at this. This is where this plastic is right here. Um, I think there's a coil spring. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Coil Spring. You're in there. Uh, it's it's kind of situated um, a little bit further forward than, say, on the RAV Scar. Ooh, uh, oh, Freudian slip. NX350H rear suspension. Uh, you do have this uh, little plastic protection unit here. That I guess is protecting something. Maybe the spring, maybe the lower arm, I don't know. This, uh, the actual lower arm is kind of nestled inside here where the uh, coil spring sits. And then you got the aluminum, this big uh, superstructure, which is super, this superstructure. And you see uh, so much of that on European cars, you see so much extensive use of aluminum, primarily because uh, it's corrosion resistant and it's lightweight. But it is more expensive. But when you get to BMWs and Mercedes, for example, and Audis, uh, the fact that even uh, even Volvos, the the uh, price consideration is not as critical as if you're trying to sell something at a lower price with other manufacturers. They they tend to not worry as much about that with the European makes, because they, it's their logic that you know you you want to car that will last so they'll, and you're willing to pay a little more for it. That's how they look at it. But there's all kinds of straight, strange structures. Look at this here. This is kind of wild. You have a uh, aluminum, was that aluminum? Yes, it sure is. You have this aluminum beam right, uh, right up here, right there. And then that comes in and it joins this. And then as you can see, there is one on the far side too. Now that looks like a chassis stiffener to me. And whenever you see stuff like that, it's a bit worrisome. Simply because it looks like they're adding stuff on later to stiffen it up because it wasn't stiff enough initially. Now there's no way I know that for a fact, but it's whenever you see lots of struts and things like that, buttresses and additional things that are put into the chassis, that's to reinforce something. And there's nothing wrong with doing it that way, 
But at the same time, in my mind at least, it's always a little bit concerning because you say, well, wasn't it strong enough to begin with? What the, yeah. <laughs> but what else? Oh, here is our massive rear differential unit, also aluminum. And our drive shafts come just out of there, just like that. And we have this uh, protective plate. You know, hey, you, you'll be able to get a better look at me than me than I can. I'll go up in here and uh, I have no idea what that's for, what that's protecting. But clearly, it's protecting something. Or it could be, as I've always talked about, this could be literally to make the uh, bottom of the car more aerodynamic because otherwise the wind would come through here, the wind, the airflow would come in through here and just bang into the uh, rear muffler and uh, drag. It's a drag to have that, and you don't want any drag. And as you can see on this vehicle, there are all kinds of panels to smooth everything out. You got this. This is this weird kind of fuzzy material that I've never actually determined what the heck it's, it is made out of, and it's becoming more and more common on more and more cars. <laughs> but its primary function is to streamline the bottom of the car. There's your lower A arm on your front suspension, and then we have another one of them fuzzy things there. And then you have... Uh, that's the general cross building, uh, probably aluminum also. And as a, a typical unibody fashion, you have these subframes that bolt into the unibody structure. And that in the subframe is what is actually holding up your suspension. And that is the way it's done. And how you isolate that from your body is, is a trick that uh, different companies use different techniques to do that. The goal being to isolate any harshness out of the suspension before it can reach the passengers. And they do a good job of that, pretty much. Um, so what else do I have to show you? Well, there should be, let's see here. There's your massive, for such a small engine, exhaust pipe. And then at the front of this right here, I would reckon, I'm looking in there, I'm looking, looking. Yep, there's a drive shaft right there. And that of course uh, attaches to your front it's more of a conventional uh, all-wheel drive system it, it attaches to the an output on your transmission and uh, this unlike almost all other BMWs is uh, primarily a front drive vehicle and there's somewhere located all through this is a system that will activate the rear wheels when necessary but most of the time if you're just tootling around on the nice, straight, smooth pavement, uh, it'll be your front, dri front wheels that are driving you the most. I would put it to you, I don't know if this is true, be a fun thing to test if I had, if I had a government grant. I would, uh, I'd wanna examine which of these two vehicles uses the rear powertrain more. Now in this case, I call it a powertrain, it's not. It's just a differential, and because it, it uses the regular powertrain up front, the four-cylinder turbocharged engine. But on the Lexus, we have a completely autonomous electric system, and it seems to me like it's in play more than this particular system is, and this is more likely to kick in in situations of low traction. So, interesting, huh? It's pretty well protected for the most part, and like the Lexus, there's a good amount of ground clearance for a small compact SUV. You're not going to be doing any Rubicon or anything like that, Moab, <laughs> or, or, or uh, transversing craters on the moon with this thing. But in general use and uh, things like forest trails and unimproved roads and stuff like that, you have plenty of ground clearance. It will be fine. Not to mention how good it will perform in the snow. And the ground clearance always helps keep you, keep you from getting all bogged. So there you go. Very different approach than the uh, the German approach is very different from the Asian approach about how they do all this. But the bottom line is a very similar ride quality to both vehicles. And uh, for most people when you're driving it, you're not going to know the difference between having an autonomous rear propulsion system as opposed to one driven by this, uh, this drive shaft, which is right up in, uh, right up in there. So, interesting, huh? Different approaches, very similar vehicles.
Well, that was a long, enduring journey, wasn't it? But now you know everything about both these vehicles. And uh, speaking of the ultimate driving machine, 2023 BMW X1 xDrive 28i, your, your bottom line on that car is uh, $46,795, which is a, uh, a, a considerable amount of money, but considering it's a BMW, that's not too bad. And then we also have the 2024 Lexus NX 350H Luxury Edition and that will uh, with all your options and everything else will set you back $58,075 a lot more expensive but it does have a lot more stuff on it and it uh, it has a hybrid system so it gets better mileage your uh, estimates are, are interesting because the overall estimate for the uh, X1 is 28 miles per gallon whereas on the Lexus it's 39 so that's quite an increase it should also be noted that the uh, X1 needs you to use that favorite of everybody, premium fuel. And now, as the clock tolls, we will now summarize these two vehicles. Uh, I found the X1 to be a lot more fun to drive, but not by that big a margin. And uh, it's got a lot of good stuff on it, but everything else considered, it's a very, very nice vehicle for somebody that needs a compact SUV. However, the Lexus has got that wonderful hybrid power plant, which gets you a lot better mileage. Uh, this particular model, the luxury model, is a lot more expensive, but if they were both equivalently equipped all the way down the line, I think they'd run real close to about the same price. So the choice is yours. And regardless of the choice you make, drive safely out there. We'll see you next time. Whatever the tube tells you, you dress like the tube, you eat like the tube, you raise your children like the tube, you even think like the tube. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion.